Here's how to drink, see? You're gonna stick around, you're gonna like it, see? And the only way you're getting out of this episode is in a pine box, see? You gotta point with your thumb. I don't know why, but that's what Edward G. Robinson did. <laughs> So we're going to talk about bathtub gin. Bathtub gin. Bathtub gin. We already did an episode where we talked about gin. So today we're going to talk about bathtub gin. What the heck is bathtub gin? It's an expression you hear a lot when talking about prohibition hooch, stuff that people make on their own. So the first thing we got to do is we got to define gin. Gin is a distilled high proof spirit that has been infused with botanicals that is uh, predominantly going to end up tasting of juniper. I did a whole episode on gin uh, where we dive into that definition and we look at all the different styles of gin. Totally worth checking out if you're interested in that. So bathtub gin would be gin that you make at home. If bathtub gin calls to mind people uh, standing over a steaming bathtub somehow and distilling in a bathtub, it's not. You can't distill in a bathtub. That's a, that's a misnomer. There is something online that there's this idea floating around that they would, you know, when people made their gin, they would have, you know, 95 or 90 or 70%, you know, high proof gin in a glass bottle and then they needed to fill the rest with water to cut it. But the bottles were too big at that time to fit into under the sink. So they would fill them from the bathtub spigot. That might be true. I don't think that's where it comes from. I think that they were, people would clean out the bathtub, fill it up with your hooch and then use that as a big bucket to mix up your infusion in and let it sit there for a few days before siphoning it back out to bottle it. I think that's where it comes from. And in fact, we think bathtub like a ceramic bathtub. It might even have been a portable wash tub. That might be the bathtub in question, just a bucket. You do need to start with some high proof distillate, some kind of alcohol. Ideally, you want something that's almost pure ethanol. Where do you get that from? Well, it's prohibition. You've got a couple different sources from it. One, you could make it if you had a big still. Ideally, if we want to make a London dry gin, we're going to look for a column still. That's hard to do, very expensive, very dangerous. We're going to talk about that too later. Where are the other places during prohibition that you could acquire alcohol? Well, you could get uh, what's called denatured alcohol. This would be very high proof alcohol for use in like Bunsen burners, in chemistry labs, you know, places where you still needed ethanol to do the thing, to do what you're doing during prohibition. They would create a denatured alcohol. They would put poisons into it and nasty smells, uh, bad flavors to prevent people from drinking it. You could take that, maybe remove those things, maybe not, maybe just cover them up with a bunch of uh, botanicals try to flavor away from them and call it bathtub gin. And that's where bathtub gin gets a very bad reputation. If you have denatured alcohol that you're trying to sneak into regular, uh, sneak out as regular alcohol, you are poisoning people. That's not cool. Another way that you might get ethanol is actually using something like this. Now this is very small. This is a two and a half liter still that I got on Amazon, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> and, uh, there were the Jenna brothers. The Jenna brothers were, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they were Sicilians. They were members of the mob uh, who were in Chicago. They ran what an operation based on home alki cookers, they call them. I love that name, alki cookers. And so what they would do is they would come to your house and pay you $15 a week to run a home alki cooker like that. You know, you can just make your your cottage industry, you know, your piecework, small amount of alcohol, and every week somebody from the Jenna brothers would show up to collect your product for the week and pay you 15 bucks. And then they would put it all in a central warehouse, pool it all up and then do their infusion and, and, uh, and, out the, and filter it and out the door it went as their Jenna brother gin. All right, well first I gotta thank Bright Sellers for sponsoring this episode, see? So uh, thanks, Bright Sellers. Yeah. You know, during Prohibition, wine was banned too. Unless you were making your own or you had an exemption for religious services, you were gonna have to deal with like a bootlegger or a speakeasy just to pick up some table wine. That's tough for me to picture. You know, like Edward G or Cagney cracking wise with some Bordeaux swilling street tufts. Nonetheless, though, that's, that's basically how it was. Happily, things are a lot easier these days and Bright Sellers is making it even easier. I still don't know a lot about wine. Honestly, I know next to nothing about wine, but on their website, they've got this little seven question quiz. It is the easiest thing in the world and they use your answers to that quiz to figure out what kind of wine you're gonna like and they ship those wines straight to you. Get this, it works. I've loved damn near every bottle they've sent and when it hasn't been an exact perfect match, I will put that feedback into the system and they use it to hone in better 
or what I'm in the mood for. It's so easy. No more slinking down at the local speaker, wire on the bootlegger, no sorry, Bob. All straight as an arrow and on the level, the wine comes direct to me in the mail. What are they gonna think of next? Every wine <laughs> comes with these little cards that help you know what you're drinking, where it was grown, what kind of grapes were used, how it was cultivated, how you should store the wine, how you should drink it, what you should pair it with, what temperature. It's great. For a wine novice like myself, I love the information on these and it makes me really feel like I'm learning something here. But here's the best part. Bryce Sellers is gonna offer How to Drink viewers 50% off their first box of six bottles if they use the link below and take the quiz and get started. All right, back to the show, you mooks. Let us assume that we've figured that out. We are either working from cleaned up, denatured alcohol, we've got an army of uh, folks working on alky cookers, making us up uh, something that we can put together and make a hyper spear from. We have a pre-prohibition cache of ethanol just waiting for something to happen to it. We have uh, a big old still out in the woods somewhere. Somewhere we're getting our 95% ethanol today. We're gonna use Everclear. And I am basing this work off of Jeffrey Morgenthaler's work, so a little bit. Well, I looked into, how do you make bathtub gin? I started doing some research. I found a blog post he had written about it. He said he wanted to make his own gin. He had a whole process by which he said, I started with 100 proof vodka and also an 80 proof vodka. And he put together a list of botanicals. Uh, apparently he did a bunch of batching to arrive at a flavor profile that was close to what he thought he wanted. Uh, and he infused it for, you know, four or five days in a jar and then strained it and filtered it and said, it's brown, but it's gin, it's good enough for me. And I read that and said, I'll do one better. Jeff, I'm gonna get a still. <laughs> so I bought a still. I bought a still and my plan was to put my infused gin back through the still to clarify it because that's what it would do. It would clarify it and then leave the flavors there, but I chickened out. So one, I don't, I'm not really sure why he went with vodka, right? To me, I think Everclear makes more sense. Start with 95% ethanol if you can get it. Do your infusion there. It'll be faster because it's less water, it's higher alcohol content, it'll strip more out of it. Um, and then cut, filter that and then cut that with water by 50%, takes you down to around 80 proof. And so a single 750 uh, of ethanol, ethanol will get you at least two 750s of your gin after you've done your infusion, maybe you know two and a quarter, two and a half. So what I did was I made two batches of gin, batch A and batch B. I'll put the recipes up on screen for these. Um, and these have been sitting uh, on my counter for oh three, four, I don't know, four days now. And they're pretty infused. You can see that the color is really gross. Um, and we're gonna taste these. Batch A is a lot closer to Jeff Morgenthaler's work, uh, kind of based on his. Batch B is more um, to, to my, what I thought would be my tastes. I don't know, this is a pretty um, experimental process. And then I was gonna strain this and filter it and run it through the stills. Just to talk about how a still works, we've got a copper pot here. We're gonna take our gin, filter it, dump it into here. We're gonna heat it up. It's gonna to start to evaporate. That gin vapor, that alcohol vapor, is gonna come up this way and collect here into uh, the line arm or the collecting arm. And you can see it gets narrower and narrower and narrower as we come along. So the pressure is going to increase and increase and increase. And that's important because down here in the condenser, we have a coil of copper that goes down. This thing coils through this bucket and we're gonna put cold water in there. And so what that is gonna do, we've got hot steam, it's gonna come into contact with this cold metal, okay? It's gonna condense back into liquid and it's gonna pour out of this hole here. That's how distillation works. What we're gonna leave behind, everything that is making this brown, all of the ugly um, solids, for sure, we're gonna leave behind. I start thinking about what I know about vaporized accelerants which is what that would be, the alcohol vapor. And I previously I was like, oh yeah, but only idiots can blow themselves up. And I started thinking about how I've got all this alcohol vapor coming up here and collecting into this ventruli. So the pressure is increasing and everything. And then there's resistance back here. This, this condenser coil is basically gonna put resistance on the flow of all of this. So this whole thing is gonna become a pressurized, uh, not quite a pressure cooker, but a pressurized sealed chamber filled with um, you know, vaporized accelerant, alcohol vapor. And uh, there's a word for that, it's a bomb. <laughs> so I got a little bit, I got a little freaked out. I freaked myself out, I've, I'm chicken shit. I decided to, I have cowered it out of doing this. The other thing too is that because it's all copper, I wanted to run it on an induction cooker, I can't. Uh, it can't be on an induction cooker, so I gotta do it on an open flame. So it's an open flame bomb. 
And so basically the safety regulations say like, hey, don't ever distill indoors, uh, only distill outdoors with one of these guys. And that's very good advice. I live in a condo. I don't have an outdoors to do this in. Uh, you know, my options were limited. So I wanted to bring it out as a prop so we could talk a little bit about distillation anyway. Uh, I really wish I could run my batch through it. I can't. I don't think that the flavor profile of this cloudy gin is gonna be very different from a clear gin after it runs through a still. And I am gonna call this gin. What I will say though is that this is sort of, um, well, this is like a, an immersion style uh, infusion. Whereas if it was a London dry gin, I think I talked about this in the gin episode, this onion head here would have a gin basket sitting in it so that the vapors of the alcohol had to pass through that and they would pick up those flavors on the way. Um, so it doesn't actually get sub submerged. It's pretty neat, actually. I think I, I'm impressed that that works, but that that works should tell you just how high the pressure, how high the heat is, and how many molecules of that vaporized alcohol there are ripping through there. Otherwise, it would never pull enough flavors with it to actually do it. So let's taste batch A and batch B. Um, I'm going to, I have these uh, measuring spoons from Barfly. They have a nice deep bowl. I think this will help me get a good taste. What I am gonna say is though that this is, like I said, super high proof. I am now gonna cut these with an equal measure of water, which brings it down to just north of 50% alcohol. No, just south of 50% alcohol, yeah. So like I said, batch uh, A is pretty close to Jeffrey Morgenthaler's recipe. Batch B is sort of uh, me taking what he started with and going off my own. As you can see, there's a lot of juniper in both of these. That's the juniper sitting on top. Um, his has a lot more coriander than mine. Mine, batch B was meant to be more citrus forward. This one has coriander and dried citrus a little bit. Um, I went with more citrus, and I think that there's some anise in this as well. So this is the batch A. It is gross looking. It is yellow, looks like swamp water. I mean, it smells like gin though. I mean, it really smells like gin. Um, I, that's fantastic. Right off the front, I'm right off the top here on the nose, I'm impressed. This smells exactly like gin. That smells like what you want the gin to smell like. I recognize that it tastes like gin. It does not taste like my favorite gin. It tastes a bit like a um, some kind of a cleaning supply. Not supremely into that, to be honest. Rinse out my mouth here. You definitely get the juniper, the citrus notes. Um, there is some kind of an astringency here that I'm not in love with, and maybe that's my mistake. Maybe that is because of something about Everclear. I don't know, though. It kind of blows my mind, because Everclear should be 95% ethanol, so. I don't know how much more it could be bringing to the table. That's why when I went with it, it'd be purer, less uh, less variables involved. Okay, this is batch B. This is sort of my own riff. Should be more citrusy. So my nose does not smell quite as much like gin as the batch A. Whoa. This tastes very strongly of um, anise or fennel. Almost like a caraway seed. It tastes like, uh, I wound up with something here that tastes a bit like rye bread. Oh boy. Uh, I think you'd have a hard time calling this gin, to be honest, in the marketplace. I, I think that the juniper is not super present. I don't love this at all. One thought I had was that a blend of batches A and B, two parts batch A to batch B, I tasted these a couple days ago to see how they were doing. I'm gonna add one part of batch B to my two parts of batch A. See what that does. Because maybe, you know, I can see that being a thing, right? You do a couple different batches and make a blend. Still has a nose very much like uh, like gin, like you expect a London dry. That is not too bad, actually. Something about blending them. Yeah, that tastes like gin. And not even a terrible gin. It's pretty good. Let's make a martini with this. I need a little bit more of this uh, tasting glass with my gin in it. So we're gonna keep going here on that one to two ratio. So I've got, you know, a test batch blend of my gin right here. Let's make a martini. Uh, I want one ounce of dry vermouth. We go with a Dolan. I like two dashes of orange bitters. And we're gonna do two ounces of our bathtub gin. Crack some ice in that, stir it up, and we'll be good to go. And I'm 
gonna garnish that with a twist of lemon. Vanish into the swamp. Uh, let's uh, try this rather swampy looking martini. Uh, although from what I can tell, this is actually gonna actually be that bad. It smells nice, nice and fresh and lemon. Oh, wait a second, I don't know. Hold on now. Oh boy. It's not very good martini. Better leave this to the pros, maybe. I think, oh, yeah, that's not very good. It's just kind of muted. Everything is like, bleh. it's like, I'm surprised actually at how not sharply juniper and citrusy that actually is. Um, and how much this dulled the flavors of the straight stuff, because that's very little, not much is coming through at this point. Um, I think the lemon expression actually took it way down because what I was tasting out of the stirring glass, even just off the spoon seemed a lot more, you know, what I was expecting here. Yeah, it's funny how when you taste it on its own, uh, a two to one of B and A seems pretty cool. Uh, when you put it into a drink, some things change, you know, it mixes differently. I don't necessarily, uh, I'm not thrilled with the way that's coming out. I'm gonna make a third batch. We'll set that up to go right now and I'll show you what that process looks like. So I'm gonna take my scale on and this is the jar I'm gonna do my infusion in. Okay, let's start with our juniper. I'm gonna go with 35 grams of juniper. I'm gonna do one of these cinnamon sticks. Break it in half. Usually a cinnamon stick, those cinnamon sticks are about two grams per. So let's see about that worked out too. Uh, these both have some dried um, or citrus in them. I want to just do fresh citrus on this. So I'm just going to take a, an orange. I'm going to peel the whole thing. I should say too, my goal with this batch is to really simplify it and kind of try to concentrate on it being citrusy and junipery. Okay, another one of those. So just so you know, that peel is about 21 grams, 21.3 grams. Another orange peel going in. Just shy of 50 grams, so I'm gonna say that's good. And now we're gonna go to a lemon. All right, that, did it. that was 20 grams. Let's see about a lime, maybe two limes. We're gonna start a slow TV channel. It's just six hours at a time of me peeling limes. But you gotta, the exciting parts are when one gets away from me. If you really love something, you gotta set it free. So I like to think too that we haven't made uh, two bad gins. We've just had two happy little accidents. And so I think that the thing I am personally missing the most in those is I want more citrus. I really want it to be bright and citrusy, I think. So this is gonna be just juniper and citrus and we'll see what that does. And now we're gonna add 750 milliliters of our ethanol. It's a one liter jar, so it should fit no trouble. And so I'm kind of hoping that what we can do uh, with all three of these batches is filter them all and uh, blend them and we'll get something nice. And so I'll just shake that up a little bit and away there they go. And we're gonna let that sit. I'll check that every day just to see how it's going. Um, but you won't be around for that. Hello from today. So the first part of this episode was shot months ago. And yes, I had originally planned to run that infused gin uh, through that little still to clarify it. And then I chickened out. Then the plan was to partner with a local distillery and have them distill my cloudy gin and shoot that for an ending. Uh, then the COVID hit and I stopped caring about clarifying my cloudy gin altogether. I also forgot to check in on that infusion or stop it. So it's just been running for, for months now, like months and months. Um, so let's strain this and see if it's salvageable or good at all. And uh, we'll blend a house batch of how to drink house gin. A cloudy, dirty gin. Okay, let's open this up for the first time right now. Ooh, stuck here. Built a vacuum? That's terrifying. Oh my god. What? Oh yeah, man. A little hiss. Oh my god. Actually, it smells really good. It smells like really good gin. I am pleasantly impressed here. Um, I hope this one was the winner. The just high citrus. I have this terrible little... Uh, funnel, I really need to get better funnels, but so be it. Here we go, we'll give this a shot. Oh, good, ah, uh, ja oh, fuck. I need, I'm getting bigger funnels, that's it, it's decided. Okay, well, we've wasted a ton of that, but that's okay, it was enough. Um, I don't know how well it's showing up back there, but I mean, oh my God, and they've turned totally crusted hard. 
the peels of orange have completely turned to like bark, completely plasticized. They've lost all color and they crumble. I can't, I did not anticipate that at all. They're like um, preserved, uh, sort of. And the juniper berries are much the same as when they went in. Fascinating. So um, I've got a glass. I'm just gonna put a drop of this in there. Very yellow in color, just intensely yellow. Almost like um, Sue's that liqueur. Woo! I think we made curacao. Huh. Oh man! Oh wow, total Loesch effect when you add water to it. That's crazy. We've made curacao by accident, guys. Shit. <laughs> I was planning to add this to my gin, but man, I really like that. It is like a, um, a very orange infused spirit. That's good. It's very good. It's super dry. There's no sugar in it at all. Huh. Dag nabbit. It's delicious smelling too. It's surprisingly good. Uh, this is a real surprise. I had no idea this was what was going on in there. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Mm. Just like orange, citrus, good. It's just very orangey. Orangey, if you prefer my New Jersey. <clears throat> and I don't know if you get too much lime, but the lime might be adding a little bitterness because we added some lime peels to it. The juniper is kind of lost. I'm going to put batch B here on this side just to refresh my memory. And I'm gonna put batch A here. Um, okay, so this was B. Okay, this one's got a lot of like anise. Whew. That's potent. Very Christmassy. Strong anisette or fennel or cardamom. Not very junipery. Wow! <laughs> this is the most gin-like. Still has a weird little note at the end there, but I bet. Two parts this, one part this, one part this. Let's try that. So I've got a scale here and I will add six grams of batch A, now three grams of batch B. And now we'll try to do four grams, you know, keep it about the same, of batch C. Yeah, pretty much. And now double it by water. Perfect, 27-ish. Okay, we'll try this. Roughly one, uh, two, one, one. I like it. That's pretty good. That's really good. The super strong cardamom after note is kind of really uh, knocked way down by the inclusion of this orange. But by, by, by men blending them this way, we also don't lose the juniper. So we're actually getting uh, juniper citrus gin that has some other stuff going on in it as well. This is not bad. It's definitely not the same as a Tanqueray or your standard London dry. Maybe you could go a little lighter on the orange. Maybe cut the orange in half. Okay, let's try that. So here we go. Okay, here we go. Uh, one, two, three. That's it. That's the gin. Yeah. Oh, and they do get some interesting cardamom in there. That's kind of nice. So it's juniper and citrus lead with a cardamom finish. Let's bottle it. That's cool. I like that. It's a little different. It's, it's pretty cool stuff though. So we know we've got 370, we have 750 milliliter bottle here and we wanna hit, um, we want half of that to be spirit. So that's like 375, right? So 187 of batch A, so 140 batch B. So 66 grams now of batch C. Two, we wanna add 375 grams of water. It should take us right to about the my math is wrong. Uh, we only had room for 323 grams of water, so I'm a little off. This is some strong gin, strong gin, <laughs> but it is gin. That is the cloudy ass how to drink gin. <laughs> well, today I finished an episode that I started months ago. Sorry that uh, it took us this long to get it done. Um, and we made bathtub gin, basically. Now, of course, this is cl not clear. Um, the way to clarify this would be to run it back through a still, which I'm afraid of doing for the reasons I've stated previously. But that's the episode. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this episode. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Greg from HTD, uh, doing live stuff from the bar, playing games on Thursday night with my friends, doing some tabletop role playing stuff. I'm on Twitter at how to drink with a numeral in the middle. I'm on Instagram at how to drink with a number in the middle there. Uh, I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash how to drink. Uh, I have a second channel called H2D2. It doesn't really have a custom URL. Actually, it might qualify now. I'll check and see if it does. And this was the show. If you liked it, uh, I do hope you will do all of the things that I that a tuber would ask you to do. Check those things out. Uh, you know, like, comment, blah, blah, blah. But um, the coolest thing you can do would be to check out some other episodes of the show. I've been making it for about five years. Actually, exactly five years. So uh, there may have been something that you missed. And uh, check out these ones. Ooh, look at these. A history, you know, breakdown of the types of gins. Um, all kinds of different episodes we've done on the show. So uh, I hope you stick around and enjoy. Have a good one. Stay good. Be good.